In today's lecture, Cam will be reflecting on the Institute's research over two decades that he led this organization and the impact that this research had on practices and policies in Ontario that protect workers from occupational injury, illness, and disability. Please join me with a well, warm welcome for Dr. Mustard. So it really is a pleasure, just gonna do that, do that. Okay, it really is a pleasure to be back in this room. I love this room. It's a great place to gather um, and have a chance to speak. Um, I'm very happy to see so many of you, our valued friends and colleagues here today. I, I do confess I'm feeling a little rusty, like I haven't been on a podium for two and a half years, but I think it's a bit like riding a bike. Let's see how it goes, let's see how it goes. So, this is my first flip with a gadget, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna start my story with a backstory about the founding of the Institute, which uh, I wanna give real credit to uh, Bob Robert Elgy, who was the chair of the Workers' Compensation Board, 1990, 1991. And the board had an issue. Of course, those of you from the WSFB would say, uh, we always have issues, but anyways, at that moment, the board had an issue, which was how to determine which clinical therapies for the treatment of work-related injury and illness should be eligible for reimbursement, to pay or not to pay. Um, and Bob Elgy was one of the most remarkable people of his generation. He's about the peer group with my father. Uh, a neurosurgeon, that just, get, that just starts it, a lawyer, member of provincial parliament, a conservative member of provincial parliament, and, a, and served for a time as the Minister of Labor. Folks in the labor movement who knew Bob called him Brother Bob, which is kind of like a cool thing if you're a conservative, progressive conservative Minister of Labor. So LG's solution, I thought, I think, was pretty bold. Let's establish an independent research organization funded by WCB premiums with a mandate to support WCB policy developments at the time specifically in uh, health services, but it's not directed by the board. So over time, this is now more than 30 years under the, the, uh, the supervision of really an outstanding board of directors. Kate, thank you for agreeing to be the chair of this current board. Um, We've, we've stretched our mandate from beyond the original focus, but we remain uh, fully committed to the purpose of what I call, or we call an applied research organization, which is serving a mandate to promote, protect, improve the safety and health of working people in Ontario, maybe our reach is a bit farther, by conducting actionable research that's valued by Employers, workers, and policymakers. That's the mandate. So today, after acknowledging Bob Elgy's role in founding the Institute, I'm going to speak to five themes, kind of big themes this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to speak from the perspective of our experience and perhaps sometimes my experience at the Institute for Work and Health as we addressed some of the issues that arise in these themes. My colleagues at the Institute for Work and Health have often spoke, heard me speak three words about what the Institute is or does. The three words are we, the Institute, are independent, we're impartial, and we're aligned. So independent means that it's our job, and our job alone, to decide how to use research methods to address a specific question. Aligned means that we work on questions that are important to workers, employers, and policymakers. We don't do a lot of what in the universities is sometimes called curiosity-driven research. The questions that we work on should be the questions that you, if you're a representative of workers, employer, or policymaker, that you would say, yeah, that's an important question. We'd like to hear what you think about that. And finally, impartial, that word actually means two things, to me at least. We don't have a loyalty to a particular stakeholder perspective. We're unaligned in that sense. We listen, but we don't particularly line up behind 
one stakeholder perspective. And the second piece about impartial is, at least my view, we don't advocate for a policy direction or option. That's not what we do. We try to provide information that helps narrow some of the differences that people might have about what the policy options should be, but, but we don't offer our thoughts on what they should be. There is one last little piece about the Institute's DNA that I, I, I think is very important. Many of you who aren't in the Institute might not recognize it, but every year we publish 30 to 40 papers in the international scientific literature. That keeps our pencils really sharp, um, but it, it also requires that we read this literature all the time. And unfortunately, it's hundreds and hundreds of papers, da 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 da, -da. you get it? But we read it because we need to know what's going on in the world outside of Ontario in order to anchor the work that we're doing in a way that's relevant. Okay, so before I turn to my remarks, here's a little humorous aside. See the color of my hair? It actually doesn't have any color. It's gray or white, depending on what the lighting is like. I'm an old epidemiologist. I'm trained in that public health research discipline. Nobody used to know what that was, right? My grandmother thought it was somebody who treated skin diseases. <laughs> um, now, after the last two years, nobody wants to hear from an epidemiologist again, right? Um, but as an old epidemiologist, uh, I found these little riffs that I'll show you on the jargon that we use in the discipline were kind of fun. So old epidemiologists never die. They just become totally confounded. <laughs> or they just lose power. Or they just reach their confidence limits. And then my favorite one, they just don't count anymore. So with that, by way of a friendly, hopefully humorous start. I'm gonna talk a bit about this first theme. I'm introducing this theme by stating something. And the something I'm stating is, over the past 20 years, there's been a substantial reduction in work-related harms to health in Ontario and in many other jurisdictions in Canada. And in order to have you come along with me, about why I would make this statement. I hope it's not that controversial. I'm gonna draw information from three very different sources of information about the frequency of work-related injury and illness among workers in Ontario. Okay, and each of the three paints a similar portrait. Okay, so the first portrait is what we're probably all fairly comfortable understanding what it is. This is the frequency of work-related injury or illness reported to the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board in 2000 and in 2019. The number of insured workers in Ontario over this 20-year period has grown from about 4.3 million to 5.7 million. That's, that's the vibrancy of the Ontario economy doing that. The, the, the pale column in 2019 is the number of injuries we would have expected to see in 2019 if the incident rate that we observed in 2000 had occurred. You with me? So it's about 400,000 injuries we would have predicted if the frequency of injury that we saw in 2000 occurred. No, instead, it's the opposite, it's not the opposite. What we actually observed, or was observed, was about 200,000 work-related injuries reported to the uh, WSIB in 2019. That's a 50% reduction in a 20-year period, but more importantly, it's 200,000 fewer disabling or medically attended injuries caused by work in 2019 compared to 2000. Here's a different view of the world of work and health. So thankfully, Statistics Canada administers every two years a large survey of Canadians, the Canadian Community Health Survey. It's about 120,000 people. If I asked you, if I asked the room, do, do any of you recall you've been invited to participate in that survey? I would think one or two of you would go, yeah, yeah, I did that. Yeah, there we go, we got one. Okay, so 120,000 Canadians, pretty long survey, about an hour. There's a question in there about, have you experienced a medically attended, no, have you experienced an injury that required medical attendance, attention? in the past 12 months. For those people who say yes, Statistics Canada's interviewers then ask, 
Did it happen at work? Beautiful, perfect. Because now we have a portrait of work-related injury, and we also have a portrait, self-reported by working age Canadians, we also have a portrait of injury not occurring at work. And we can look at a time trend, in this case, 10 years of time. Non-occupational injury happens about six times for every 100 people. No change in that 10-year year period, sorry, no change. But work-related injury, as self-reported by participants in the Canadian Community Health Survey, declines by about 7% a year. Excellent. Here's some more. If we use some additional simple calculations to determine what proportion of all injuries reported by Canadians, working age adults, to the CCHS are attributed by them to work, it's 27% in 2001, and it drops, and it drops, and it drops, and it drops, such that by 2010, it's about 17%. This is what I mean by a substantial reduction in harms to health arising from work in Ontario. But here's a third view. And here what I'd like you to do is go down to this bottom line, total all external causes. And as you go down there, I'm going to tell you what this is. This is a portrait of visits to Ontario emergency departments for the treatment of traumatic injury. Every visit to an emergency department in Ontario generates a, a, an electronic record that if you go through the protocols, you can access as a researcher. Over this time period, what is it, 2004, 2011, about 800,000 work-related injuries and about 5 million traumatic injuries that didn't arise at work to working age adults in Ontario. How do we know they're work-related? Because the, clinic, the clinical staff in the emergency departments take a history. If you've ever visited an emergency department for a traumatic injury, they'll ask you, how did this happen, right? And that's how the emergency department clinical staff determine work-relatedness. There's some other stuff here we can talk about another time. But the point is, this is a mirror image of what the Canadian Community Health Survey tells us that non-occupational injury doesn't change, that's the bottom row, over this seven or eight year period, but injuries that are attributed to work decline by 6%. And I'm just gonna point, if I have the time, I think I do, I'm just gonna point to one other observation in this table, which is motor vehicle occupant, that row. So these are injuries that are attributed, are caused by a motor vehicle collision for lack of a better word. And notice how the reductions, both of which are substantial, occupational and non-occupational, notice how they're almost the same. Why is that? That's because it's the same roads. It's the same rules of the road, and whether you are driving a vehicle in the course of employment or driving to a golf course, my premise is the risks are the same. Okay, that's the first thing. So far, so good? You're not chasing me out of the room? Okay. The second set of observations, employer or workplace OHS expenditures are substantial. Now I'm gonna tell you what I mean by that, and hopefully you'll agree, <laughs> you'll agree. So what's this about? Okay, here's the backstory. We became aware, aware maybe 15 years or so ago that some work was done in the European Union, a, an economy that trades much with us, right? Work was done in the European Union suggesting that the average, I'll say that, the average EU employer is spending something like 1,200 euros per worker per year on OHS, on prevention. And I said to myself when I first saw that number, Ooh, that's a big number. Like, is that plausible? But more interestingly, I couldn't find anything that would be the parallel for a Canadian employer. Like, it just wasn't there. So curiosity got the better of us and me. And we reached out to about 350 employers, Aaron, thank you, to ask them if they'd help us see what the numbers are in Ontario. Okay. So here's what the numbers are. I think you can see this, yeah. So the table is divided into two categories, goods producing employers, that's up at the top. The hazards in the good producing sector are higher, the hazards to harm 
are higher than in the service sector. So you see that the expenditures reported by employers in the goods producing sector, $2,400 per worker per year, are about three times what they are in the service sectors. The number here at the bottom, $1,300 per worker per year, is awfully close to what the EU study found. And you may be curious about what the components are. I, I could go on about this, but I just want to touch briefly on the main component. This is manufacturing. The main component, about half of the $1,500 on average that's spent in manufacturing. The main component is a category called organizational management and supervision. That's your salary, Aaron. That's the salary of the seven people that work for you. About a third of this, $800, and by the way, Aaron's in construction, this is manufacturing. About a third of this is the efforts of the Joint Health and Safety Committees. Neat. And then about another third of that 800 is the work supervisors, the time. Supervisors put in maintaining the organization's compliance with their policies and practices. Then you can see the other information in the figure. What's my, my, my final point is these expenditures dwarf, and this is not a criticism, they dwarf what the Ontario Ministry of Labor spends on labor inspection, which is about $40 per worker per year. You got the scale here? So my premise here to you is that we have to believe that one of the reasons we've seen in the previous theme, this substantial reduction in work-related injury and illness in Ontario, is this. It's the spend that's being committed, not by every employer, but by many employers, inside their workplace to reduce the risks to workers. Okay. Third thing. This is not something that I can say this is not something I can say the Institute for Work and Health has established by research. It's just something that, man, has this, has this ever been my experience over the last 20 years? That if organized labor is up close to a particular problem, it's a strong driver for positive change. One of the reasons this is true is the principle and the practice and the respect for tripartite governance is very strong in this country. And we need to remember, this country is not like all the other countries. I'm sorry. That's not true in many other countries around the world. This principle that workers need to be there, employers need to be there, and the regulators need to be there to work together to address a particular problem. And I've listed here three uh, examples where the Institute for Work and Health was invited to support some important by tripartite reform processes, the Dean Panel, 2010. Uh, there was a Mining Health and Safety Prevention Review, 2013-2015, and a, a very challenging piece of work uh, co-led by the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Health to refine the practices that we were going to be following to reduce harms arising from violence at work, particularly in healthcare. And a shout out to Henry and your colleagues at PSHSA for all the heavy lifting you did to build all those materials. So my point is we were there, but really we weren't pushing these processes. These processes were being pushed largely by the work of organized labor. Okay, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a sideways thing here, just first to remind us that in 2010, uh, there were amendments to the Occupational Health and Safety Act in Ontario that really clearly specified the employer's obligations around preventing harms arising from violence and harassment at work. 2010. Here's a confession. We, the Institute for Work and Health, didn't really understand what the burden of violence and harassment at work, particularly in the human service occupations, we didn't understand it, we didn't know about it, we didn't even recognize it. This was not us. This, I'm pointing up here, this was organized labor advocating aggressively that we needed to have stronger protections. Okay, and they won, they won. They won, we all won, we all won. I'm gonna push the button here in a moment to play a short video that flashes us forward in time about 10 years to the International Labor Organization. They're over in Geneva. 
It's a multilateral organization, about 150 country members. Every country sends a tripartite delegation. They send a labor rep, they send a worker rep, and they send a government rep to hammer out various issues around harmonizing labor standards around the world. 100 years old, the oldest multilateral organization in our world. OK, what am I going to do? OK, so about two years before 2019, the ILO impaneled a technical committee to do some work on a convention standard that the ILO might adopt, if everybody agreed, around the prevention of violence and harassment at work. And on that technical committee were two Canadians. My friend, Rakesh Patry, who's uh, a director general in ESDC, the federal go uh, government department, and Claire, no, Marie Clark Walker, also my friend, who before she stepped down was the secretary treasurer of the Canadian Labor Congress and was the labor co-chair of this technical committee. Okay, what you're gonna see is what happened. This, ladies and gentlemen, was a historic opportunity to shape a future of work free from violence and harassment and has presented you with instruments that are based on a human-centered approach. Instruments that are practical, implementable, and therefore ratifiable. It applies to the public and private sector, the formal and informal economy, and in urban and rural areas. Its scope is indeed broad, but so is the reach of violence and harassment in the world of work. Every person in the world of work should feel that this convention and recommendation applies to them. It also demonstrates the value, the power of tripartitism and the role the ILO can play to help improve people's working lives. Employers want to see harmonious and productive workplaces and violent and harassing behaviours place that at risk. Nobody should be subjected to violence and harassment at work. This is really a groundbreaking convention. This is the first time that we have uh, standards that uh, say very clearly what violence and harassment is, that it has not to be tolerated, what to do about it. The enthusiasm, the excitement which attended the adoption of these instruments does testimony to the fact uh, that they can, and I'm very confident will make a difference to the working life of very many people around the world. I congratulate you on adopting the Convention on Violence and Harassment in the World of Work. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And there were Canadians there. And this wouldn't have happened, this is my view, this wouldn't have happened if, if the ILO didn't have access to the regulatory precedents that were established in this country a good seven, eight, nine years before the ILO wrapped their arms around this and said, can we do this? So be proud, be proud. Okay, the next thing. Occupational Health and regul uh, OHS, regulatory standards enforced and enforcement are effective. Now for most of us, you're thinking, that's pretty obvious. But over the last 20 years, it's been far from, over the last 20 years, there's been a far too much controversy about this. So various points in time, various jurisdictions, take a look at their labor inspection activities, and they say, oh, we can do without this, or we can cut it back, or we, can, we don't have to do this, right? And those of us in Ontario on the regulatory standards and enforcement side will, will know what I mean. These conversations do happen. So, what I'm going to do is just riff through quickly some examples of how I think excellent research over the last 20 years has helped reduce the amount of controversy about this statement. Okay. The first one is a clip. This is not institute research, but it's, it's a clip from one of the best studies in the last two decades. It was published in one of the premier top three science journals in the world. And the headline is pretty clear, right? The trick for this kind of high quality research, and I don't want to get too researchy on it, but the trick in this case is 
can we find a way to have really good information about the frequency of injury, illness in a workplace before it was inspected? and then come back after and measure the same thing and compare the two. And most importantly, can we randomize which firms get the labor inspection, especially if we cluster firms together so that they have similar risk profiles? That's what these people did. It, they, they did the trick. It's really good work. It's California. You're thinking, does it apply to us? Our view is the international scientific literature in this area does generalize. If it worked in California, it's probably going to work here. Okay. Here's a local example from uh, the Institute for Work and Health. Most of us will recognize or remember the regulatory standard implemented in the 2015-2017 period requiring construction workers who worked at heights, that's you're up in the air more than three meters above the ground, I think, Linda, three meters, I think. Um, you have to go through a mandatory one-day training program on fall protection equipment and how to address that particular hazard. My, oh, sorry, this standard was a direct response to the Dean panel in 2011, which was in fact paneled because for, Four people died when a swing stage failed on a construction renovation project, but that's getting into the history. My colleague, Linda Robson, completed a really very thorough evaluation of, the, of both the reach and the impact of this standard on worker health protection in the Ontario construction industry. Linda would want me to acknowledge she couldn't have done it, and this is about tripartite. She couldn't have done it without the advisory committee members from the labor side and the employer side of the construction industry who provided important guidance along the way, also couldn't have done it without the work, the collaborative work from the Infrastructure Health and Safety Association who made much of our activity possible by connecting up with us. So there's three points here I would make. The first is, and I have to tell you, I have always been astonished by this, the reach of this program. Two years, and the, and the regulation says, if a worker works at heights, they have to get trained. 400,000 people, amazing. That's called reach. That's called a regulatory standard that hit the mark in terms of compliance, for lack of a better word. The second observation is the reduction in injuries arising from fall, the reduction in working at heights injuries was, I think, substantial, but a 20% reduction that we think we can comf comfortably attribute to the training that followed from the standard. And the third thing that is really, to me, fascinating and is important, and we need to understand this better, the biggest reduction occurred in the smallest firms. Hmm. So, Rod, we got to work with this, right? How did that happen? But that, this is an example of a powerful regulatory standard that did everything. It reached, it got the target audience, for lack of a better word, and it reduced the hazard and it penetrated to even the smallest of firms. A last example, just checking my time. I'm okay. Um, this is a little clip from a comment that came out from the US uh, Occupational Health and Safety Federal Regulatory Authority, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And as will happen, these, the authorities, regulatory authorities, will go through periods of renewal, reflection, let's loosen, let's tighten what we're doing. This was a period of time when the regulatory authority had the political authority to tighten, to make the regulatory and enforcement activities stronger. And one of the things that David Michaels, at the time the assistant secretary, attributed expressed appreciation for was that he could draw on a systematic review, a review of the empirical scientific literature that my colleague Emil Tompa led, that said regulatory, ins regulatory standards and enforcement are effective. It was a very clear review in terms of, of drawing out some, some clear, confident observations. And this is a statement from David Michaels just saying thanks. So it's an example of two things. It's an example of how good research goes global. It's useful no matter where you are. And the second thing, just to pat ourselves on the back, it's, it's an example of our research going global. 
Okay, there, That's, those are my riffs on the effectiveness of regulatory standards and enforcement. And I'm gonna sort of close, my fifth theme is just to review, is that the right word? Reflect on the experience that we've had over the last 20 years as the WSIB has gone through a quite an amazing period of innovation and reform. So if we go to the period 2010, 2012, there was a great deal of anxiety in Ontario, the government, about whether the WSIB's unfunded liability was gonna sink the ship. It was scary. Now, it was scary then, but the good news is over the last 10 years, following in, in many ways advice from Harry Arthurs in his funding review, and the hard, hard work of people in the WSIB, the unfunded liability was eliminated in 2018, like 10 years ahead of the legislative schedule. It's a hell of an achievement. There's a bunch of other stuff about rate framework reform. Were we there? Well, a little tiny bit. I mean, I don't think any of this would have happened if the, any of this, I think all of this would have happened if the institute wasn't there. But at the same time, along the way, we'd be asked, oh, you know, do you have anything that could help us think this through? Do you have anything? Da, 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 da. So we, we were certainly there. And I'm going to just tell a little bit of a story about the new service delivery model. And John, you're in the room. Just want to acknowledge that was great work. That was great work. Uh, here's the, the back story here is that for a period of time, maybe about 10 years from the 1998 reforms, the Workplace Safety Insurance Act, to about the end of that next decade, 2010, the WSIB noticed that the proportion of disability episodes that were of long duration were getting, long, they're getting longer. There were more of them and they were getting longer. This is a problem. This is a problem. So we were invited, Judy Geary was the lead at the WSIB, we were invited to just sit down and talk. Like what, what did we think from the research side might be helpful in addressing this problem of more long duration disability episodes and more of them. So I think John was about 18 months maybe, a process of about 18 months. It was a great dialogue. We'd say, uh, have you thought about this? They'd say, yeah, yeah, we thought about that. We'd say, how about this? They'd go, that's a good idea. Back and forth like that. And at the end of the process, and again, we weren't designing it. We were just interacting with the designers. At the end of the process, the new service delivery model was really a remarkably coherent set of adjustments, a case management framework. It actually brought case management back within the WSAB. Creation of some new roles, somebody called a return to work specialist whose job was to intervene, I think I can use that word, in a disability episode where a worker in a workplace were having difficulty figuring out a return to work plan. Great idea, great idea. And perhaps even more important, figuring out a way to make a timely first decision. Are we gonna accept this claim? In the, in the old days, before this framework, it could be weeks. The goal here was to let's do it as quickly as we possibly can. Great, super. So this uh, figure is just clipped out of a WSIB report. It's actually a really good point, report. Uh, from tipping point to turning point, the elimination of the unfunded liability. People are getting their claims approved faster. 2009, 65%, only 65% were approved in the first two weeks. 93% after the new service delivery model. Getting people into uh, integrated healthcare programs. You can see the improvement. And this one is perhaps my, I don't want to say favorite, but this is the one that impresses me the most. For those of you who have been around for a while, there was a program before these reforms called the Labor Market Reentry Program. And the idea was that, the recognition was that unfortunately some workers would not be able to return to work at the ad injury employer. They needed to find perhaps a new occupation. And the Labor Market Reentry Program was designed to provide that, uh, to provide that set of skills so that the person could go out into the labor market and find employment. And it never, it did not work. Let's be clear. It did not work. The labor, the new service delivery model brought this back inside the WSIB. It's a service we're gonna deliver. 
and the achievements are quite impressive. Okay. All right, my last one. You doing okay so far? This one's gonna get a little complicated, but the, but the outcome is, I hope I can make the case, the outcome is the way in which, at times, those of us on the research side of a system can contribute some clarity to those, in this case, WSIB adjudicators, about how well they're doing. So the backstory here, really early in my time as the president, I got a call from uh, the vice president of policy at the WCB, Judy Geary, no, Linda Jolly, sorry, who said, um, a member of the board of directors of the WSIB has asked for some information on how well the WSIB's administration of permanent impairment benefits, I'll explain that in a moment, how well it's doing in terms of the legislated obligations. And I said, mm, Linda, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Give us a couple of days to think about what we might do. Give us some time to think about it. Um, and my colleague, Emil Tampa, had, an, had a brilliant solution. So, do I need to tell you about this? Okay. Let me first tell you about permanent impairment. So for some workers, disabled, by work-related injury or illness, there's a recognition, and this, this, this entitlement is in all the provincial compensation schemes, a recognition that maximum medical recovery will still leave that person with an impairment. It's permanent. It might be hearing loss, might be a finger gone. It's a permanent impairment, and the compensation authority has the means to provide a benefit that recognizes that, on average, permanent impairments will lower a person's success in the labor market. You with me? You got the idea? OK. So Emil had a brilliant solution. What would happen if we could link the identity of a permanent impairment beneficiary to their income tax records, Canadian Revenue Agency, annually for a 10-year period? And that's what you see here. OK, let me just walk you through this. And Emil, just to say again, this is brilliant. This is really brilliant work. Each beneficiary has been matched to eight to 10 other taxpayers, matched as in same age, same gender, and same income in a four-year period before the permanent impairment beneficiary was injured. So this is the period in this horizontal, horizontal axis that goes minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four. That's four years before the injury. And you see how there's no difference, if you understand the vertical axis, there's no difference between the permanent impairment beneficiary earnings and their control earnings. They're the same. And then what happens? So the lines here are grouping beneficiaries by the degree of impairment. Okay, there's about 10,000 people here in this graph. By the degree of impairment from relatively mild, less than 5%, to very severe, greater than 50%, okay? And what do you see? This is labor market earnings of permanent impairment beneficiaries after the injury. And this is the reason why we have this benefit, is that on average, somebody whose impairment is rated at 20 to 50% is in the labor market only gonna earn on average half of what a matched control person would earn. You with me? This is why we have this benefit. Okay. So here's the same information, it's just oriented slightly differently. Your two, your two left-hand columns, if you add them together, it's about 40% of the permanent impairment beneficiaries. About 40% of the beneficiaries earn less than 50% of the earnings of their control, their matched control group over 10 years. Like, that's a big problem, okay? And there's 10% over there on the far right-hand side who succeeded in the labor market despite their impairment. They earned basically about, if not more, than their match control. Okay, here's what happens when you add in the benefits that the WSIB, that the WSIB adjudicates and awards. Okay, look at those two left-hand columns. In the pale blue, that's, bef that's just 
sorry, in the pale boot, that's the comparison based only on earnings in the labor market. In the dark blue, as you add the benefit amount to their earnings, what used to be 40% of people earned less than 50% of their control group, it drops to 13%. It's like, wow, in terms of an, of an important achievement of a social objective, which is, as I would put it, because we can't make people whole, at least we can try to address some of the financial consequences of the impairment. Okay. And on average, across all of the heterogeneity, there's a big researchy word, that's, that's in this community of people who have permanent impairments, on average, the combination of labor market earnings plus permanent impairment benefits was 100%, 104% of the average earnings of workers who were not injured. And to me, this is a really impressive example of how an important social security program is doing what it's supposed to do. So the work that Emil led us through was not about, oh, you need to fix this. It was an answer to the question Linda Jolly asked, how well are we doing? And the answer is, this is really impressive. Okay. All right, so some final thoughts. Peter, am I more or less on time? Mm, not bad. Okay. Okay, so 20 years in the same job. Like, who does the same job for 20 years? What's wrong with me? Uh, but I, I've just got, like, maybe four observations. Uh, thank you for your attention. As I did this look back, I, I said to Peter yesterday, man, there's a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor that didn't get into this talk because, frankly, you didn't pay for, like, a day, did you? Right? Um, but I hope it's been informative. Um, I do have some thoughts on what the priorities might be in the decade ahead, and, and I can hear you thinking, yeah, yeah, of course you do, but I'm not going to go there, because our time's up, um, and you've been very patient. But, but here's four thoughts about 20 years in the same job. One reason I did it for as long as I did is the work is really important, right? Um, you can feel it. There are... There, this, is, this is amazing to me. There are 175 million workers in North America. There are only three research organizations that I would say are focused on what the Institute's focused on. There's the Institute for Work and Health. There's IRSST in Quebec. And in the US, there's the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, which is an arm of CDC. It's not quite as independent as we are. Three. <laughs> and 175 million workers. Like, this, uh, the opportunity to be at the Institute is a really unique responsibility. Okay, that's number one. Um, the second is, and it's what we all say when we say thanks, that was great, it really has been fun to work with very talented, thoughtful, creative people at the Institute who I can say really confidently all share in the mandate that we hold important. It's been really, really satisfying. Um, the, th the, th the third thing about why would you be in a job for 20 years? Uh, I'm going to kind of throw this one back to those of you in the room who aren't researchers. And it goes like this. If you've been a regulator, or you are a regulator, or you work with a compensation authority, or you're a union member, or you're an employer representative, you've consistently told us, me, us, that you really value the work we do, and it's valuable to the work you do. So you've encouraged us. And frankly, it's your fault that I've stayed for 20 years because of how much you encouraged us to do what we do. And the, the, um, the final thought is something I've realized perhaps in the last, I don't know, a couple of months. You know, I opened with Bob Elgy, that story. Um, I realized I'd really had a personal commitment to see Bob's vision, I think it was an imaginative thing, succeed. Like, they don't, these things don't happen very often. Let's create the Institute for Work and Health. It doesn't, doesn't happen very often. And I, know, I knew Bob well enough to know, because he has a, he's a grouchy side. He has a grouchy side. I knew him well enough to know that he would have been very cross if we had let this kind of slip through our fingers. So. 
Thank you for attending. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Peter's going to say a few words. I can't wait to mingle and catch up. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Cam. We do have time for a few questions. I know most of you are wondering what is going on next door, but uh, we'll, we'll pause that one to later. Uh, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask Cam at this time, we do have a little bit of time before we um, move on to the networking session. Sarah is holding the mics. Kim has a question. You, you mentioned how occupational health outcomes have improved over time. Uh, I unfortunately have been involved in a number of fatality investigations and I don't see the fatality rate decreasing over time. I think there's been a lot of research on that. And I just wanted to get your insight as to you know, where should the industry and uh, organized labor go to try and tackle that incidence of fatalities. Thanks, Kim. Am I on still? I think you're on. Am I? You know okay. Um, man, I, I don't really have an answer except that I think the wisdom that is available, this is, I hope this makes sense. You know, it's, it's mandatory that there be a coroner's inquest in the case of an occupational fatality in construction, mining. Am I right so far? Yeah. And in those inquest processes, we can learn a lot about the, what went wrong, much like you just described, participating in investigations of fatalities. I think we need to go there and look and really understand, like, is, is there a pattern here? Is there an instant? Is there something we can learn? What is going on next door? <laughs> I might have one cam just while if other people are uh, while other people are thinking so I had a similar question to Kim about what still needs to be done so you've talked a lot about some of the gains that have been made in terms of work injuries we've still got the gap of fatalities and you had sort of alluded to this at the end and was left on the cutting room floor but in your opinion, where's, what's next? What, what is still the contribution that the Institute can make as hmm. we look forward? Hmm. hmm. What would I think? Well, again, this is not to throw rocks at anybody, but um, many of us will be sort of familiar with the fairly large problem in this country about underclaiming is kind of the simple way to describe it, which is work-related injuries or illnesses that were caused by work that aren't getting reported to the compensation authority. And it's actually a big number. It's about 40%. Are not, and it doesn't matter what jurisdiction you're in, it's about 40%. And we had the opportunity a couple of years ago to speak to about 600 people in British Columbia who had had a work-related injury illness that resulted in two or more days of absence from work and they hadn't filed a claim. Why? Number one reason, it's about 40% of people, I didn't know enough about it. Like, I didn't know what the compensation system was. I didn't know about it. And frankly, I think the paraphrase is, and my employer didn't tell me about it either. So lack of knowledge. About 30% of people said, well, it actually wasn't worth the trouble. And of that group of people, an important number said, by the way, my employer covered my absence, right? Like, they paid me. They covered me while I was away. All right. But about only 10% said, you know what, the reason I didn't file the claim is because my employer was threatening me that if I did, there'd be consequences. So that's suppression, that's actively suppression. So that's kind of one. I have, I have a couple more. Let's yeah. Okay, but that's, that's over on the integrity of the compensation system. A hundred years old, the oldest social security institutions in this country are workers' compensation. <laughs> Man, it's crazy. I, I, I meant to bring this along. 
No, I won't even go there. I won't go, I, so, let me answer your question. So here's another one. There are a lot of people working in Ontario who aren't eligible for WSIB coverage because they're self-employed. You see where I'm going, right? And there's probably a lot more of this kind of employment now than there was 20 years ago, and certainly more than there was 40 years ago. So I think, Peter, I don't know if it's a research thing, but I think we need to figure that out. And some of the ideas coming out of the Ministry of Labor, that's what I'm going to call them, about how to build a, a secure benefit net for people, no matter how they work, is a great idea. Is a great idea. Those are two. Um, I think I'll stop. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Cam. That brings oh, us. Oh, 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 oh look what's happened. We have Matt. Matt's look, got a question. We got two. Actually, two. Two more questions. We can take two more. Hey, Cam. Um, oh, that's loud. Uh, just. They're from, cheering you, Matt. Yeah. No. No, they're not. <laughs> um, from from the research funding perspective. Uh, I would say there's not a lot of opportunities for, for organizations like yourself to actually go out and kind of hit targeted funding competition. So what would you like to see from some of the funding bodies that exist uh, to maybe grow the pool available for funding? Wouldn't or, that be or, great, or... Matt? Wouldn't that be great? Now, so, so Matt's the person most responsible for the WSIB's return to funding research to support the uh, important responsibilities the WSIB has. Uh, you know what, I mean, Peter would have views on this. Yeah, we're, we're not spending enough, right? We, we, it, let me put it a more positive way. If we spent more, there'd be more value coming from it. How much more? Call me, I'll tell you. Well done. So thanks, Matt. One more question. Is that on? Yep. Okay, my question's a little out of the box. Um, but, so I'm an entry level um, like I'm just coming out of my master's, I've been struggling to get through it, but I'm very curious about how, because you said there's only, there's three institutions like this in North America covering 175 million people, and I feel that the way our society works in terms of everything being very siloed, that we need to have more organizations like yours in terms of inter-silo collaboration to really, to not duplicate resources, to have better effects on things, and I'm just curious to know if there's more vision of like an organization like this, but for it, like to cross across society to really bring things for people's mental health and also organizational culture, I think is something that really needs to be addressed across the board in society. And I just was wondering if there's anything that you would have to talk about that. Thank you. Also, I'm Michael. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think all I can say is you gotta hope and and look for people like Bob Elgy who are brave enough to say, well, there's nothing like this out there, but I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and make it and see what happens. So, you know, hopefully over time there will be more organizations like the Institute for Working Health. Peter. Okay, thank you. So that, that, I think, brings us to the end of today's lecture. Before we move to the networking event that'll follow, I'd like to once again thank Cam for his presentation and especially for his Two, year, two decades, two years, two decades at, at leading the Institute. I'd also like to take this time to acknowledge the excellent work of the staff of the Institute in terms of organising this event. Um, Christina, Ludmila, Wynne, Sabrina, Tanima, uh, Cindy, but in particular, Sarah MacDonald, our Manager of um, Knowledge Transfer and Exchange, who has pretty much single-handedly got us all into this room and organised everything. Um, Thank you very much uh, to everyone for, and in particular Sarah, for organising the event. Um, um, as Kate mentioned at the start of today's lecture, the foundation for research in uh, the foundation for research and education and work and health is a key supporter of the Atkinson Lecture. Uh, the foundation also currently supports research awards both for graduate and postdoctoral researchers at the Institute for Work and Health. As I look around the room uh, this evening, I can see many researchers who've been positively impacted by Cam's mentorship, his guidance, his support, in particular during the early stages of uh, their research, and I would count myself as one of them. So I'm pleased to announce 
that at the Foundation's annual meeting this year, the members of the Foundation Board endorsed a proposal for a new research award to be given in honour of CAM. This award is tentatively named the Cameron Mustard Early Career Development Award. It will be given annually to a Canadian early career researcher to fund activities that will help promote, develop and or accelerate their research career. The award will recognise CAM's sustained commitment to developing capacity in the work and health research community in Ontario and in Canada more broadly. And you can watch out for more details of this award in the late spring and early summer of 2023. And the best way to do that is to keep up to date on evidence-based practices at the Institute. If you aren't a subscriber, please follow these links and subscribe. So please join me once again thanking Cam for both his lecture this evening and for his many important contributions to work and health over his research career. Thank you.